All right, thank you very much for the music ministry. Let's turn our Bibles now to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And today we're going to uh, start the uh, main parable that we have in chapter 16. And again, another great, uh, it's actually not a parable, I should correct myself there. It's actually a story, it's easy to say parable, but it's really not a parable, it's a story, an actual story that our Lord and Savior uh, Jesus Christ gave to the uh, uh, apostles, the disciples, and even in the face of the Pharisees based on them ridiculing him in regard to his teaching on finances and wealth. And just as we saw the great parable of the prodigal son in chapter 15, now we have a little, we had a little parable in the first part of chapter 16 about being a good steward of your finances, and then uh, some principles in between that, or after that, in regard to how to deal with finances, how to treat them, then a rebuking against the Pharisees, as we see in verses uh, 14 down through verse 18, in regard to their treatment of finances and wealth and how they were loving money more than they were loving God. Now in the last story that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives to us here in chapter 16, he continues that theme of the rebuking of the Pharisees in regard to the love of money, but it is also giving us great information more about what happens in the afterlife if we are lovers of money here in this world. And specifically in this case, we're talking about the unbeliever who is a lover of money, who then utilizes that finances and wealth that blinds them from seeing that they have a Savior in Jesus Christ. It blinds them from seeing that they need a Savior with the sin that they have within their life just as we all need a Savior, because of the sin in our life, and it blinds them from seeing their own position as a sinner that needs a Savior, and then it also blinds them of knowing that uh, they have to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior who paid the penalty for their sins. That's really the overall message that we have here in this storyline of the rich man and Lazarus. It's about being a good steward, uh, and if we are a good steward, as Lazarus was a good steward, Ultimately, there is reward in the eternal state. So what we're going to note here is uh, uh, this now great storyline. But in this storyline, we see much more than just a discussion about finances and the treatment of that and the results of that. Because we also have the storyline of what happened to two individuals when they leave this life and then go into the afterlife and the results that they have to experience for all of eternity in the afterlife. For the rich man who rejected Jesus Christ, he is going to be in torment for his entire life, or I should say afterlife. But for the poor man who was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be in heaven for all of eternity, also called paradise, uh, as we uh, will see throughout Scripture. So there's a lot of information to go through as we understand this great storyline. A lot of different points and principles and precepts, little different twists and turns as we're going to see as we go through this. So we're going to take our time as we understand this storyline. But it's going to be very hard for me to do that because just like, you know, when we sit down for a meal and we eat our dinner like it's the last meal that we're ever going to eat, we've got to get it in, get it in really quick and and fill ourselves up, okay? I tend to do that with my Bible study. And I want to get everything to you in one time, in one sitting that we're together and get you all the information because I don't know if I'm ever going to see you again. Uh, Although I should know that I am going to see you again and have faith in God and trust in God, which I do. But in any case, uh, sometimes I want to just give you everything all at once, okay? So we're going to take our time as we go through this because there's a lot of different points, principles, and good storylines as we read this story, again, a true story of the rich man and Lazarus. And so as I said, this continues to the warning of being lovers of money. Even though we are talking about the result of an unbeliever who has lots of money, we are seeing how they're blinded by that money, not to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then we have a poor man who has no money whatsoever, but yet he believes in Jesus Christ, and as a result of that is blessed in the eternal state because of the faith that he had here in time. So it continues to understand that position of being blinded by money and wealth and the material things of this life, which every single one of us who live in the United States of America are a very wealthy and rich individual. So we've got to be careful about that. 
even as a believer, not to be blinded about our spiritual walk with God. And again, the res- I'll, I'll get into this in a minute, but the resources and the blessings and the riches and the wealth that God gives us to, there's nothing wrong with those things or enjoying those things. But if we place those in priority over our relationship with God, that's when it gets to be wrong within our life. Here we see the wrongness of the lifestyle that one individual was living in and the, again, judgment that he will receive in the eternal state, being in the eternal lake of fire for all of eternity because not of the wealth and finances and riches that he had, but ultimately not believing in Jesus Christ. And as I said already, and I've uh, said to you uh, probably a week or so ago when I was uh, introducing the chapter, this is not a parable. A parable is a made-up story and an object lesson that Jesus gives, and he kind of has fictitious characters in it. And what's different about this is that there's actually a name given to one of these individuals, one of these, the poor man being Lazarus, and that is the only time, if this were a parable, that a parable would have a name of an individual in it. So in and of itself, just by having the name kind of disqualifies it from being a parable like the rest of the parables. But the other thing that we also see in the parables is that when Jesus Christ gives a parable, then he spends time explaining the parable either to his disciples or to the people afterwards. This one, he just tells the story, and that is enough. He doesn't go on to explain it afterwards as to what it all meant, because this is a true story. This is actually what happened to two individuals who were here on planet Earth, had a life then died and then went into the afterlife in two different directions uh, after their death uh, here on planet earth so uh, that's what we're going to see here again this is a true story it's not a parable for those couple of reasons that i gave to you but this is also sometimes called rather than the power the story and i'll say parable i know i'll I'll trip up on that because everything else has been a parable so excuse me if i do uh, say that from time to time but in any case it's a storyline okay that is also titled sometimes dead men tell tales okay because we're going to see the story of two dead men and the results that they are currently dwelling in in the eternal state but ultimately being a result of what they did here on planet earth so they're telling a tale telling a story that we need to understand and recognize understand it from the position of an unbeliever who doesn't accept christ as their savior and then also as a believer who did accept christ as their savior and then the situation that they're in in the eternal state so as we uh, read through this there are really three perspectives that we're going to see uh, in this storyline and this story that Jesus tells us. And the first one is in verses 19 through 21. And that's the perspective of life here on earth. And I'm just going to read through it and give us a good overview of these various points and principles. And then with the time that we have left, we'll start getting into some of the detail, but we'll do that over the next uh, week or so. And again, we've got the Thanksgiving celebration in between. So again, the next couple of weeks probably uh, in this uh, storyline. So first and foremost, in verse 19, it says, Now there was a certain rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen gaily living in splendor every day now what i found very interesting about this is that we have two descriptions of this rich man we have a description of his clothing or how he dressed and then we see a description of his lifestyle and we'll talk about those things when we get there and uh, probably get into some of those this morning but we'll see uh, what that's all about as well But the interesting fact is that this is then compared against Lazarus, the poor man, as we see in verse 21. It says, In a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at the gate, and he was what? Covered with sores. So we see the rich man who was dressed with lavish clothing, fine linen. We're going to uh, talk about some of the detail. Kind of cool how you see how they made clothes back in the day. We'll talk a little bit about that. But then what is Lazarus dressed in? He's dressed in sores, or we could say boils and sores that were like pus and blood just oozing from his body all over, okay? That was his clothing, okay? That's the description, and so that's the difference that they had here in this life on planet Earth. And then it says in verse 21... We see his lifestyle, and it kind of started uh, back in verse um, uh, 20 where he was laid at a gate, okay? And uh, what's interesting about that, and get, get you more detail later on, but that somebody placed him there or people placed him there. He didn't put himself there. 
he was laid at that gate. He was kind of just left there, okay? He's a rotten corpse of a pussy body, and then people picked him up and just dropped him at this gate, okay? And uh, the Greek really gives us some emphasis on that that we'll speak to. But again, that's part of his lifestyle, being laid at a gate, but then 21, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. So that was his lifestyle. Rather than gaily and joyously living with all the riches that this world can offer, he was ultimately dying to just have crumbs that were falling off a table. Absolutely starving and uh, being very hungry and just longing for any food that would come his way. And what's interesting about that too is it's the same type of description that we saw of the prodigal son when he as a believer was having difficulty because of his rejection of God's will and plan for his life going off in his own direction into the world. But he too under the divine discipline of God came to a wretched state like this individual did as well. But this individual is very different because we don't see this as divine discipline. It's just the state that he was in. And again, just because somebody is rich doesn't mean they're going forward in the plan of God. Just as somebody who is poor doesn't mean they're not going forward in the plan of God. We can't make accusation based on lifestyle and appearance. Again, we don't know what's in the heart of someone's soul unless they communicate it to you, but God does. So again, it's getting back to that point, too, that we've seen in chapter 16. God knows the heart. He knew the heart of the rich man. He knows the heart of the poor man. He knew the rich man was an unbeliever in this case. He knew the poor man was a believer in this case. And then it goes on to say, to give us even more emphasis, if you, to gross us out even more, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now, you can take that two ways as we look at it. One way is that maybe they were helping him, okay? Because that's how dogs kind of, try to heal themselves. They lick their wounds, okay? So the dogs were his best friends at this point in time. And as we're going to see as we get into some of the detail, remember dogs are also considered in the Bible in their application, especially during the time of Jesus in Palestine during that day. They were lowly animals. They weren't the little furry, fluffy pets that were man's best friend back in the day, okay? They were wretched just running around the streets trying to get anything they could to eat. So they weren't the nice, cuddly man's best friend in this case. So again, they were the lowest of lows, okay, uh, in society as they were considered. But they were his best friends at this point in time. They were even coming and caring for him, the lowest of low. So we'll talk more about that uh, in uh, application later on. So now as we look at verse 22, we see the second perspective, and this is the perspective of death. And this is very interesting too. Now it came about that the poor man died. Okay, so he died, death like we all, you know, death and taxes, it's, uh, we're all going to face it someday, unless we're part of the rapture generation, okay? We're all going to face it someday. But uh, again, the poor man died. But what happened to him? He was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Okay, And that's a place that was in S.H.I.E.L.D., also called Hades. It was a place called Paradise uh, back in the day as well. He was carried to that place. That's where the believers would go to. And he was carried by angels. Treated what? Like royalty. He was escorted to his eternal abode, which was Paradise, uh, by the angels. So even though he was poor in this life, he was rich and wealthy in the eternal state with a lavish life being in paradise. All right, then it goes on to say, it says, uh, and the rich man, and I love this, also died and was buried. (laughs) You can kind of read it like that. He died too and he was buried. You know, nothing, 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 nothing. But we do see a little bit more about this individual coming up. But we see no pomp and circumstance in regard to his death. Yes, he might have had a great funeral, a great burial from the earthly realm. But when we get to the spiritual realm in the eternal state, he died and was buried. He was in the grave and that's it. Okay? But we see a little bit more about that in the third section. Because now the third perspective is the picture of the afterlife prior to the death and resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. He went to a place called Sheol or Hades. Again, the Hebrew and the Greek we have there. Again, Sheol and Hades, same place, but again, two different uh, 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 names for it based on the language. But that is the place of the afterlife for the Old Testament saint, as we would say, up until the point of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have in verse 23 through 31, as it says, and in Hades, and that's what we have here. In the uh, New Testament Greek, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away. And this is Abraham, again, the father of the Israelite or the Hebrew nation, who is also the father of all who are spiritual. Remember, Abraham is all of our fathers. He is the great example of faith in Christ for salvation, not by works, lest any man should boast. So he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So that's what the rich man saw when he was in Hades, which is that place of torments. And we're going to go into detail on that. We'll talk about that when we get there and understand what that Hades is currently still in existence and then what will happen to it uh, at the great white throne judgment seat of Jesus Christ. So in verse 24, this is the rich man. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. So we have some description of what Hades, which also the eternal lake of fire will be like. It's like being in a flame. It's like burning and, you know, burning, and you know what, what it means to burn yourself and to have a severe wound or the pain and suffering that comes from burning. He's in agony in that type of thing. It's like he's burning up. He, he's burning without burning up, okay? And terrible agony. And he, all he wanted was one drop of water to be on his tongue. So you see the dryness and the, you know, the complete famished nature uh, that that also describes for us as well. Again, we'll get into uh, more of that detail when we uh, get to this passage as, uh, in due time. So again, dip the, ting the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, that's an interesting phrase, word uh, choice there, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus had bad things. But now he is being conf uh, comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able. So those who might have compassion and mercy for those who are in uh, Hades at this point in time, they were forbidden from doing that. So even though they may have that type of compassion, they were not allowed to do so because that was their final judgment from God. All right, so can't come over from here uh, to you, uh, may not be able. And that none may cross over from there to us. And again, who wouldn't want to cross over from that place to the place of paradise, as it were? Again, we understand that. Now in verse 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place for torment, or this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Now when he says Moses there, he's talking about the law, five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. They have Moses and the prophets. Just as we saw earlier with uh, verse 16, when Jesus spoke about the law and the prophets up until the point of John, were great witnesses or evangelists of the gospel. Same message here. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Kind of interesting, too, when you think about the Pharisees and Jesus witnessing to them. And even though he rose from the dead and witnessed for, what is it, about 40 days after the fact, or 10 days after the fact, okay? Witnessing for that period of time, showing himself, the people knew that he rose from the dead. They still did not believe. 
And that is the hard-heartedness of that type of individual. That's the hard-heartedness of the self-righteous, legalistic, arrogant, religious type of person. And it also can be the hard-heartedness of the rich person who doesn't think they're a sinner, they don't need a Savior, and therefore do not accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord. So again, as you can see, there's a lot of information that we are going to flesh out in there. That's kind of a general overview of the things that we'll be noting and discussing as we go through it step by step. But there's a lot of great principles of Bible doctrine that we are going to note as we go through this. And we'll begin really in verse 19 this morning, understanding the perspective of of the rich man and his life here on planet earth. And then again, how that leads us to warning us, even as believers, not to be overwhelmed by the riches of this life and instead continue to have God as our number one priority. So let's go back to uh, verse uh, 19 and we'll see the first main character that we have here. Again, Lazarus being the second, but the first main character. And we'll talk a little bit about this individual, that being the rich man. And again, uh, the same uh, Greek word, poulos, for rich. Uh, man sometimes uh, is not anthropos, is not used uh, in this passage, but we have poulos, so it's just the rich, but we know it's the rich man in this case. And we understand that he is a wealthy individual, uh, both in his cloth, clothing and in his lifestyle. Now, the fact that we also have to point out, which we have been doing, is that there is nothing immoral or wrong or sinful in being rich, okay? Nothing wrong. So you can't look at a rich man and say, they're a sinner. Unfortunately, in our society today, we're seeing more and more of that creep in, especially when we're talking about socialism and communism. Oh, why does that one get to be rich, but this one has to be poor? Why is there such a discrepancy? And so in doing that, they vilify those who have wealth and riches. And we should never do that as Christians. Never vilify those who have more than you or the rich people of this life uh, that we would think are richer than you as being an evil, wicked, rotten sinner. Okay, That is not the determinant whether they are a sinner or not. Their lifestyle, their behaviors, their mental attitude determines whether they are a sinner or not, whether they're a believer or not. And nor should we have the attitude of tearing down the rich so that we can redistribute that wealth to the poor. That is not God's plan for mankind. In the law, in the New Testament, uh, God had a plan for dealing with those who are poor and how he was able to bless the rich so that they could have their wealth and riches be given also to the poor as necessary. And even back in the age of Israel, remember, as they would have to uh, as they would, say, have a field, a, a field of corn or grain, as we would call it today. They would have a field of grain. God said, when you plow that field or uh, uh, you know, uh, reap that field, he said, reap it in such a way, kind of in a circle format, so that the corners are left untouched. And what were the corners for? Those who were poor. That they would have to pick themselves up and go to the corners of the field and then ultimately harvest the corn or grain for themselves. And they freely could do that. So if they couldn't care or provide for themselves through a job or having their own field or uh, some other means to provide for themselves, God would provide for them in that form or fashion. And yes, the rich man would help out in that situation by not taking everything for themselves, but leaving the corners of the field so that the poor people could come and take and have uh, the food that was necessary for themselves from that area. So again, God gave an example of, yes, I am going to bless the wealthy, but ultimately in blessing the wealthy, they are actually providing for the poor. And in that, we see how God blesses wealthy people in our life so they can provide for those who aren't as wealthy through jobs or uh, other uh, uh, modes of operation, even taxes as they would pay their taxes. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to tax them completely, because remember, it was only the corners of the field okay, that were left. But the majority of it, which is probably like 90%, was left for them. 
And they would utilize that. And then with that, they would provide jobs for people to plow the field, sow the field, reap the field, or tend to the field, harvest the field, and then also you know, get that to the market as well. There would be many jobs that would be provided in that. And then with the grain that was there, that could be sold to the society so that other people would have grain who probably weren't able to grow it themselves. So again, I think you understand that uh, principle and philosophy, but yet socialism and communism as we're seeing in our day and age as we've seen well you know especially the rise of communism over the last hundred uh, plus years is not a system designed by God a redistribution of wealth is not God's plan and just because this individual has wealth does not make him an evil person in and of itself but it's a, an object lesson of how wealth can be a blinder to the rich to never come and believe that Jesus is their Savior. Never come to the point that they recognize I'm a sinner and I need a Savior and that Jesus did come to pay for my sins and through him I have eternal life. That's what this object lesson is all about. It's not about you know, a, a, a diarrhea against those who are wealthy. Because many times God blesses the wealthy so that they can provide for other people within a society as well. So redistribution, socialism as we're seeing you know, uh, crop up and pop up more and more in our country today is not a good plan. And you can even, well, I don't want to get into politics and all that stuff. Is I could easily do so. But you even see it, you know, in nations that, are, that have this type of communism, you know, type of society. They are worse off as a whole compared to an open, free society like the United States of America. And again, we even have people uh, from our own church, <laughs> from Brazil, right? And they know what that socialist type of uh, you know, uh, mentality brings. And it doesn't bring about wealth for the people. And even the poor people, as we know, in our country are wealthier than most of the people in other countries around the world. So again, this is something that we have to be careful of as Christians, not to vilify those who are rich and, uh, rich and wealth, not thinking that we need to redistribute their wealth in that formed, uh, 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 forced way, that we don't do that. Because ultimately, when you have that, and again, I'll even talk about uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, maybe this will be my Thanksgiving message on Wednesday night, but even the pilgrims found out. When they landed at Plymouth Rock and they st started their little society there, if you ever read the history, they had a communist type of society where everybody would just do their thing, but whatever you would produce would just be put into the kitty, and everyone would just take from it. And what they found out, and you can see the letters, uh, uh, especially of, I think, Miles Standish and some of the, uh, Bradford and some of the other, you know, the governors back in the day and the, uh, the leaders of, of their day, they wrote things that said, you know what, when we had that type of society, the young men who were, could really do the most work were not working hard at all. Because why should I work hard when I'm just going to throw it in a pot and everybody's going to pick from the pot? You know, oh, by the way, I can just pick from the pot anytime I want, so why work hard? And they found out right away that that system did not work, even in a little village like Plymouth Plantation. And so they changed immediately. And they said, you know what? No, nope, we're changing. We're not just throwing everything into a pot and everybody just picks from the pot because it doesn't incent anybody to work hard. And that's what you find in communist countries and uh, socialist type of countries as well. Why would I want to work so hard when I'm just going to throw it into a pot? You know, by the way, I can just take from that pot any time. Well, that pot's going to provide for me. So I don't need to work. So I'm just going to sit back and just reap from the pot rather than working to contribute uh, for my own uh, sake and for my family's sake, but also for society's sake as well. There's nothing wrong with some taxation, but when you tax so much and so great that it disincentivizes and you just are handing things out freely, like I saw something on the news, everybody should get 2000 bucks a month and you get free this and you get free that and free this. Yeah, sure, I'll pay me. I'll take it, okay? Yeah, I'll sit at home to do nothing to get $2,000 a month. I'd be happy to do so. No, I wouldn't really, but you know what I mean. But many people have that mentality, and it disincentivizes. So in any case, um, you know, we shouldn't function and operate in that mode of operation. And just because somebody has wealth or riches doesn't make them a bad or an evil person either, and we shouldn't vilify in that sense. Again, they could be a bad or evil person and be poor too. So it's all about the mentality of the soul and what we've understood through this scripture thus far in uh, chapter 16, is that what? God knows the heart of a man. 
So even though they may be uh, uh, rich and wealthy, their heart could be good, their heart could be bad. Even though they're poor, their heart could be good, their heart could be bad. Yet one thing that the wealthy people should not do, and we are also seeing that, and that's sometimes what leads to, again, the attack towards the wealthy people, is that they lord their wealth over other individuals. And they start to you know, you know, lift their nose up in the air and look down at the, uh, their nose at the rest of the people. And so they start to lord their wealth over other individuals. And what does that mean? They start to grab authority, and they start to grab power. And even we're seeing that in our society today. If you've watched anything about Congress this past week and having Twitter and Facebook and all these other companies come before because they're doing what? They're on a power grab. And they are eating up little companies and destroying those so that they have more power. And they're going to now tell you how to think. Oh, by the way, that's been going on in our media for the last 20 to 50 years where the media is trying to grab up all the power and tell you what to think, okay? And try to dictate to you how you should operate in this way and operate in that way. Probably this video will get banned when we put it online, but we'll see. All right, but in any case, that's what they're trying to do. Trying to do things to feed you information. And again, go to Netflix, watch the show Social Dilemma. You will be freaked out about what the phone does to you, okay, and what social media is all about. And you'll think twice about how you function and operate with social media as a result. But again, unfortunately, the wealthy also get that mentality, where now because of their wealth, they think they're a little bit better than everybody else, and they know better than everybody else, and they want to dictate to you how you should function and how you should operate. And it's amazing to me that companies like that and wealthy people like that tend to lean to what? Socialism. But why is that? Because they want to keep everybody else down. They want to keep people in poverty. They don't want to give them the freedom to rise up on their All right, so in any case, where was I? All right, but again, you can't go to Thanksgiving, but I can go out and do anything I want. You can't do this. You've got to stay home. You've got to limit the number of people, but I can go do anything I want. Again, isn't it amazing? The people in power can do anything they want, but the rest of us have to do what they say, and we have to be limited, and we have to be restricted, and we can't do this, and we can't do that. What are they doing? They're lording their wealth, their power and authority over the rest, rather than allowing freedom for people to make good and wise decisions. It's, you know, <laughs> I love the, the new saying, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, staying for, uh, 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 I think it goes like this, it's, uh, you know, uh, staying for thee, but it's going, what is it? <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's, that's a general saying. It is for thee, but not for me, okay? This is what you have to do, but not me, okay? And those are typically the ones that are making decisions. I don't have to do it, but the rest of you do. You have to be good, you know, little uh, people and be lemmings and follow along as we say. But in any case, 
I digress. So the rich should not lord their wealth over other individuals who are less fortunate than them. And again, you know, God's got a plan for everybody. Some people it's going to be to be wealthy, and for some people it's not going to be wealthy. He knows what's best for each and every one of us. He knows, uh, you know, how we will uh, best grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he also knows that uh, for some of us, if we get the riches, we're going to be miserable. We're going to be destroyed as a person. And we're going to be all about the riches rather than going forward in God's plan. But he also knows for other people that if they do have the wealth, they're going to be what? Givers of that wealth. And God will be able to use them to give you know, to the poor, to the church, to uh, his mode of uh, uh, means and uh, the work and service that God has for them. He knows they're going to be helpful with their riches. So he blesses them because he knows they have a heart of giving or they have the spiritual gift of giving. So again, you know, God knows the heart of everybody and he's got a plan for each and every one of us as to what will be best for us and what ultimately would be best in his uh, plan and will for our lives. But unfortunately, one of the main problems uh, that riches does bring is a worldly problem-solving device. And we even see that in the United States of America with all the you know, resources and assets and all the great medical fields that we have. Again, are we praying to God to heal our nation from the COVID virus? Or are we praying to the doctors and nurses that they come up with a great medic- medicine so that we are healed and recovered? Or maybe have a vaccine? And again, nothing wrong with medicines, nothing wrong with vaccines. We pray to God that he provides people and, uh, to do those things. That's great. Get the vaccine if it comes out. You know, be safe. Make a good decision on your own, just like you need to be safe and make a good decision on your own about the virus right now. But in any case, make good, wise decisions. But unfortunately, many times we can be praying, you know, Again, when we're praying to God, maybe the, in the back of our mind, we're thinking the doctor is a God or the nurse is a God or, you know, uh, the governor, governor is a God. He's going to help me. He's going to heal me. He's going to provide for me. He's going to have all the decisions. And isn't it interesting that, uh, I'm getting all in politics, but isn't it interesting that during this COVID virus, how most of the state governors wanted to be told what to do by the president of the United States, who they all hate. Yet they wanted him to be a dictator. Isn't that interesting? And he refused to be a dictator. And he said, we're going to provide, we're going to give you support, but it's going to be you. You've got to do your state. You've got to deal with your state. You've got to figure out this. You've got to figure out that. They wanted a dictator. But you know what they really wanted? To blame him. Exactly, exactly. They wanted somebody to point the finger at so the finger wasn't pointed back at them. So, again, that's how money corrupts okay money corrupts the mentality of our soul we want to blame somebody else we want to make them accountable make them responsible we don't want to make our own decisions or you know uh uh, be responsible and accountable for the things that we do on a daily basis we want to be able to blame somebody else okay so in any case that's what uh, riches can do to us in this world and uh, uh, believe you me anybody who's in a a political uh, position at the federal uh, level at the top of the state it's funny how they you know they're all spending hundreds of millions of dollars to get a job that pays less than a hundred thousand dollars a year huh why would you do that why would you spend so much money to get a job that pays you less than the average person makes in the business world hmm Must be some other reason, okay? And there's some backdoor finances and wealth and power and riches and all this other stuff that happens. Again, it's just unbelievable. But once they get that, they don't want to lose it. They want to hang on to it with all they've got, typically. But then you get eventually the rich man or the wealthy individual or even the, uh, the, uh, the, the one with power and authority who doesn't think like that. And they think differently. And they think in terms of freedom and privacy. And that's the way that God thinks, in terms of freedom and privacy, so that individually we can care for one another. Individually, when there's a problem, like the COVID virus or some disaster or difficulty or problem in your life, you do what? You turn to God rather than turning to man or yourself to provide your solutions. And as we have here, all your wealth and riches. You see, money can be a problem-solving device for people. 
And it is in the United States of America, even if you don't think you have much money. Again, you can look to your government or, you know, the society and the wealth in the society and government and try to reap that to solve your problems. You rely upon your government. You rely upon your doctors. You rely upon, you know, uh, your health care work or whatever the case. You're making other things and people in your life a God when there's only one true God. And unfortunately, when there is a lot of wealth in a society or in your own bank account, you don't need to turn to God as much because you're going to get your way out of it. You're going to solve some problems. You're going to have better medical treatment. You're going to have you know, more food on the table. You're going to have you know, a, a roof over your head. You don't have to turn to God. You've got your needs taken care of. And you're comfy with that, so you don't need to turn to God. And that's one of the problems of wealth is that it can be a problem-solving device rather than turning to God and the problem-solving devices that His Word gives to us on what we need to do if there's difficulties or problems uh, in, in our situation, disasters and whatnot. Rather than turning to God, we turn to every other thing. And again, that's what God does not want to have happen. And so if we have riches and wealth like we do in the United States of America, again, Remember that. And don't turn to those riches and wealth to solve your problems. Turn to God and His Word to help solve your problem. And seek Him out and pray. And then ultimately let Him lead and guide you in the problems and difficulties that you may have on a daily basis. And just be careful. Just try to be careful if you have great wealth, as we all do. That you're not looking to those things and saying, well, I don't need to turn to God. Because it's going to hurt your relationship with him, both in time and in the eternal state as well. So, again, uh, one of the things it does, as we've already noted, for the unbeliever is that it blinds them to seeing that they need a Savior. And it blinds them from knowing, uh, you know, heaven and hell are out there waiting for them and ultimately which one they would go to. They are blinded to that completely because it's all about this life and the stuff that I have right now. I mean, I can't see what's beyond. I don't really know that it exists. So why should I be thinking about it or worry about it? I'm just going to worry about right now and the power and the wealth and the resources that I currently have and try to hold on to it and maintain it as best as I can. Again, that can be the problem of wealth and riches. That, again, even for the believer, we have to be careful about that it doesn't become that in our daily walk as well. So this leads to not needing uh, Jesus as a Savior, not believing to, into the Christ as the Messiah. As you know, uh, uh, Jesus was uh, sa- telling this story in regard to the Pharisees uh, 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 sneering and making fun of him, the scoffing that they had when he was trying to talk about wealth and finances and how to be a good steward of them, knowing that They were bad stewards of the resources that God had given to them, the authority and power that God had vested in them. Again, Jesus Christ gives this information so that they could wake up from their spiritually dead state and come to know Christ as their Savior. And as we've noted in the past, but uh, uh, just to continue to remind ourselves, in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, it says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does a profit? You can have all the riches, you know, uh, the bumper sticker or the license plate that said, you know, whoever has the most toys win, w- at the end wins, okay? No, that's probably the loser. That's the one who loses who has the most ties, toys at the end because it was all about the toys and nothing about God. So for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And as we know, you know, money can't buy your way into heaven. Your human good works can't buy your way into heaven. Money can't buy your way into heaven. And as the Beatles used to say, money can't buy you love either, okay? So it can't buy you love. Money can't buy you certain things. There's a lot of things money can buy you that are problem-solving devices uh, for that individual, but it can't buy you love and it can't buy you heaven. And again, heaven comes because of the great love of God and Jesus Christ that was poured out onto us. You can't buy that. The only way you can get it is to receive it through faith by saying, yes, I do believe. Then God gives it to you. He gives you love and he gives you heaven. He's already given us love through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Whether we have received that or not is based on uh, whether we believe it or not. So again, uh, this is what the doctrine of redemption is all about, how God has purchased us from the slave market of sin. Money cannot purchase your sins and give you eternal life. 
And the rich man spent all his life concentrating on just that, his finances, his wealth, his resources, his power. Spent all his time on that, and everything that he did was about his self-indulgence. That's why we see in the fine linen, again, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of detail on that on Tuesday night, the fine linen that he clothed himself in, uh, with, and then the, you know, the gaiety of life, the joyful living that he lived here on planet Earth. Again, lots of song, lots of music, lots of you know, probably wine and uh, whatever alcohol they might have had back in the day, okay? Lots of dancing and lots of parties and lots of those things. He was occupied with all those things. And having them, gaining them, and maintaining them, rather than being occupied with Christ. So this all goes back to what we also have in Luke sixteen thirteen. Remember, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Again, we can have God and wealth, okay? But we can't serve wealth if, we're ser- if we are serving God. Or we can't serve God if we're serving wealth. Vice versa. Okay? So you can have both, but you've got to have one as your number one priority, and that would be God. And put Him as a number one priority in all things, and then enjoy the wealth that He has given to you. Okay? But don't make it a priority in your life. Again, you can enjoy the United States of America, the riches and the wealth that we have, the prosperity that we have as a country. But again, that does not become our priority. What our priority is, is our relationship with God and then living our daily life in the blessings that he has for us and giving thanks every day for the great blessings that he's provided for us. In Mark chapter 10, verse 25, it says, It is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We've talked about this verse, and again, it's not an impossibility for the camel to go through the eye of a needle, a small door at the uh, gates of Jerusalem, as it were. It's not an impossibility. It's very difficult, all right? But it's easier, okay, for a camel to go through that small door, that small gate, than many times for the rich, unbelieving man to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. So with that, we understand that wealth can be a blinding hindrance in our life to our relationship with God. Certainly for the unbeliever, it can be very blinding, as we know, but also for the believers we've talked about, even though this uh, storyline doesn't speak specifically about that. But for you and I, it can be very blinding if we are so focused on the material things of this life that we lose our perspective and focus on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And God wants us to keep focused on Him. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Keep thinking of the things above, not the things that are here on this earth. Because as the rich man found out very quickly, the short life that he lived on planet earth, again, with all the joy and happiness that he had, is nothing compared to the eternal state of now the suffering that he is experiencing. And absolutely, if he had a way to change it, as we've said, he would change it and he even wanted to change it so bad send back Lazarus to tell my brothers tell my brothers I don't want them to be here either again he finally had compassion for his fellow mankind and recognized how the riches blind people certainly his brothers from seeing the Savior and so again uh, we have to have that mentality and instead walk faithfully in God and in Jesus Christ each and every day as we serve him as we should, and thus enjoy the blessings and give thanks for the blessings that he provides for us each and every day. All right, we'll close there, and we'll uh, pick it up on Tuesday uh, with uh, more information in regard to this storyline. All right, so uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to the cross to die for our sins, through whom we have eternal life, just by believing in him. Again, what the world sees is uh, ridiculous, you have given to us is truth. And what the world sees is too easy. You have given to us as a place of rest. And so, Father, we know just by simply believing in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we do have eternal life and salvation. And by believing in his word and your great plan after our salvation, we have a great spiritual life here in time and then also in the eternal state as well. And so, Father, we ask that you help us to keep our thoughts and focus on you on the easier path than on the more difficult path that the world looks at. 
and that the world rejects uh, the easiness of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we just ask for faith more and more each and every day as we walk and glorify you and ask for your travel blessings as we go home today. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much. All right, now we'll take of our offering. We'll have uh, Deacon Barry come forward. We'll take of our offering. All right, let's uh, pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you bless our offerings and all those gracious, generous givers of our offering so that we may continue to meet our financial obligations. In your word, the truth will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>